Hi everyone. We're just getting set up and sorted out over here. How are you doing today? Hi Hanami says, hello, you are my favorite artist on Elfwood. Always loved your work. Well, thank you so much for following me since the Elfwood days. <laughs> it's been a while. Oh, and here I have a piece of chocolate on my painting. That's the... <laughs> All right, let's see, getting this all into position so everyone can see things. Working on a lot of fine detail stuff today. Doing all these roses. I've been working on these roses all morning long. It is now two o'clock. Okay, so morning and afternoon, and I still have many of them to go. <laughs> I always ask myself, why do I do this? Where I have a lot of repetition in the pieces, but you know, I kind of like doing it as well. I actually enjoy repeating motifs in a painting. So I've got many, many roses to go still and many little hummingbirds to do as well. And that's probably what you'll see me doing here now. Because like I said, I've been working on this since this morning and I've only gotten, <laughs> well, the roses and these little hummingbirds done. And also some of this tangled snarl of vines over here. I started on that last night and I really started pulling out the the foreground elements of them today. And so a lot of this is done with dry brush. I do an initial wash on the roses with some base color. And in this case it's going to be buff titanium on these guys in the lower portion because I actually want the ones closer to the door to be a really vibrant blue and the ones towards the edges are pale white roses. But I want a little bit of that blue to sort of leak through so while it's still wet here I'm actually just doing wet on wet a little bit of blue on the, those upper edges of these two roses here in the foreground, just to let the, the color seep out from that edge, as if it's seeping out from the center of this piece. And that's what I did with these other two roses already. I had this base tone of buff titanium with a little bit of blue, lightly dabbed in there, wet and wet. Sam is asking if I'm making any more palettes in the new fu near future. I don't have anything in particular on the plate right now, but I am open to hearing suggestions. If there's something that you are really desiring, feel free to toss that out at me <laughs> as a potential thing to think about later. Cyberpunk Not Dead says, oh my gosh, this is a giant work. It is a 14 inch circle diameter. Let me see if I can zoom out. No, I can't zoom all the way out for this to see. But yeah, it, it's, it's fairly big. It's not the biggest I've worked. It's like a medium, medium large size for me. So just so you can see, here's a ruler and you can sort of get and get a picture of the dimensions of this so you know this is like five inches across is what you're viewing on the screen here so this is about a third of the width but yeah I anticipate this probably taking me until the end of the week at the very least to complete it's a 
gradual thing, especially since I still don't even know what I want to do with the upper portion of it. I have a, a pencil sketch of what I originally thought was going to be the focal point of the piece. I, I wanted to have a fiddler uh, standing on top of this wall, but then I started sketching it and the door stole the show. <laughs> <laughs> Even before I painted it blue, it was already looking like it needed to be the centerpiece on its own. And so I decided, at least I think I've decided, I, it's not 100% a done decision yet, but I think that the fiddler is going to have to wait for another painting in the future where she can be the star of that one and I'm just doing dry brush shading here to shape the petals of the rose and in this blue section on the upper side of the rose I am using no surprise blue to shade it and then as I move towards the lower edges, the front facing ones, petals down here, which I want to have in a not blue color. Uh, I will be using maybe potter's pink and, and some purples to, to do those shadings and maybe neutralize it a little bit with some Payne's gray so that it's not so pink and purple looking. So it's always, it's always kind of tricky. And it's okay for this in particular to have a little bit of that pink purpley look because that's what roses are like. They have a little bit of a blush of color even when they are white, right? Sometimes they have like a, a greenish, yellowy, white color, uh, creamy tone, and sometimes they edge more towards the pink. So thinking about those as I select my colors for the shading of the petals, and that's what's going to affect the impression overall of what the actual local color tones of the petals are. Sam is asking, would I make my palette out of glass? I'd have to look into that. I have no idea if that's possible. A palette made two times the size made from glass would be my dream. <laughs> Blue is my favorite color as sea sparks is. I love it. I love it too. I am always excited to find really vibrant blues for watercolors. And what, I, what I've what i used on this piece is Roman's, uh, Roman says mall. It's ocean blue and cobalt teal are the two that I am using. Do blue roses exist? Someone says no, not that I am aware of. They do not. However, there are a few rare plants that do have blue flowers um, and they are this kind of teal color. I have one or two of them in my garden that I sought out because it's such a unique and neat color to find in nature for flowers. It doesn't happen very often but there are a few plants that do. I think one of them is this South African plant. I did a botanical painting of it once. I can't remember what it's called. Let me see if I can find it right now. Because I have it on my botanical art side of my website. So it's botanicalart.shadowscapes.com and it is called... Let's see. Oh yeah, the Cape Cowslip, uh, Lacanelia viridiflora. Here, I'll link that 
in the chat here if you wanted to see it. And another blue plant, blue flower, that is really cool are the Himalayan blue poppies. Although those are more of a purpley, lavendery blue. So that, that kind of blue I think you see a little bit more often. The, the really uh, over-the-top greenish blue color is just something you don't see as often. Oops, I made that too blue. I forgot I wanted to make these more towards the pale white-ish tone. So I just dabbed it, dabbed up the wet paint with a paper towel. And you can just do that while it's still wet. And since my color is not very intense and concentrated, I'm able to do that without staining the paper. So some colors though, they do really stain. And so as soon as you set them onto your page, they really start to soak into the fibers and get absorbed and you can't just lift them up as easily as I did just now with that. Blue roses are not natural in real life. People dye them all the time. Yeah, they do. You can find a lot of dyed versions, dyed pictures, if you just search Google. They're, so, they're sort of a, just this completely fantastical uh, and magical thing, I guess, for people. Have I heard of the corpse flower? It's a giant flower that smells like rotting flesh, apparently. Yes, I have. <laughs> they are, there are a whole number of plants. They're called carrion flowers because they rely on flies and other carrion feeding insects to be their pollinators. So instead of bees and butterflies and things, they, they rely on flies who like eating rotting meat. And so in order to attract those friendly bugs to do their bidding, they have a scent that smells like a rotting body. I have some, some of my succulents are of the corpse flower, carrion flower variety. And they are really cool looking, bizarre looking plants. But you know, you want to hold your nose <laughs> when you get close to them flowering. There's one that I have that I've been waiting for it to flower. I've had it for maybe four years now, and I, I don't know. I think I'm screwing up with something because I've never yet gotten it to bloom, and I really, really want it to bloom because I really want to paint it as a botanical painting subject because it's such a unique and bizarre-looking plant. But at the same time, I've been wondering, you know, because it hasn't yet bloomed, <laughs> And I've heard that this particular one is a pretty stinky one. And I've been wondering, oh, I wonder, I don't know if I'll be able to stand having it in front of me as a subject matter. <laughs> if it really smells as bad as that, I, I don't know if I want to have it inside on my desk for hours on end, unless I hold my nose. But, you know, so far it hasn't been a problem yet because I haven't gotten it to the blooming stage, sadly. If it does happen, uh, I'll let you all know. I'll, I'll show you the plant, in fact, if it does bloom. I'm hoping for a flower this spring, this time. I feel like I deserve it because I've had, I've been nurturing this little plant for so long. Uh, but yeah, the, the botanical garden near me, so I'm lucky enough to be near a very amazing botanical garden. It's, it's the Berkeley Botanical Garden. And they have one of the giant corpse flower plants. It's, it is a flower that is maybe five or six feet tall. If you, if you search on Google, you'll see pictures of them because they're just, they're just this bizarre looking thing. They look like, I guess they look a little bit like a lily, um, except it's a dark maroon color with this giant phallic pistol right in the middle of it. <laughs> And it only blooms for 
a few days once a year and there, there's not a whole lot of these plants that are around in private collections because it's a tropical it's a tropical thing and so the few that are in private collections they they get trucked around to various botanical gardens and put on exhibit for people to visit when they come to their blooming time and people will line up to come and see these things and smell them <laughs> because they'll smell for days before they actually even open and I think they only open for a, a few days but once they open it's supposed to be extremely pungent <laughs> and so the, the local botanical garden here does have one that they're able to borrow and display uh, I, I don't know if it's yearly but I know that it's happened several years and there's always articles newspaper articles and things about it when it happens and I go visit the garden pretty regularly but I have thus far avoided whenever they have the corpse flower exhibit thing because I I really don't want to smell it <laughs> see. Oh, I've got people coming from all over the world. Buenas noches. Hello from the Netherlands. Uh, Azerbaijan. Thank you everyone for checking in from all over. Invisible Law says thanks for digitizing and posting your works on, digi on, on Instagram. Well, thank you so much for enjoying and viewing them. I appreciate all of you as well. So yeah, nature has does have all kinds of really interesting and bizarre plants and animals out there. What I love doing with my botanical art is is always finding really intriguing textures and shapes paint. Those are, those are the ones that I like to use for my subjects. You know, there's, there's some botanical artists out there who just love doing perfect flowers and they're gorgeous and beautiful, but it's not, not what I enjoy the most. I enjoy having something, something odd or unusual in the plants and things that I choose to paint whether it's the seed pods or the dry and dead shapes of some of the leaves curling or the coloration. So when, at one point I was thinking I could seek out lots of naturally blue plants to paint. So, so far I've done two. Like I said, I've done the, uh, the, the Lacanelia and the Himalayan blue poppies. I wish I could grow Himalayan blue poppies here, but the weather is too warm for them. As their name suggests, they are from the Himalayas, so they like colder temperature. But there's this gorgeous garden in Seattle, actually. It's, that's where I first saw them, and that's where I took all my reference photos for the paintings that I did of the blue poppies. But in Seattle, they apparently do have a temperature that the poppies appreciate. Compto Pikachu says, it's so helpful to see a professional artist completing their watercolor work. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is nowhere near completion yet, though. Like I said, this is going to take quite a while to complete. This is probably one of the 50 to 80 hour pieces. <laughs> because of all of these roses. And I haven't even started. Well, I did start. I did those three little hummingbirds, but there are plenty more in this piece. So this is one of the paintings that is going to be 
shown in my gallery show at Haven Gallery in a few more months. The show takes place in May of this year. And I've been working on paintings on and off for it over at least the past six months. So it's it's been a while of slowly gathering steam with the works that I plan to be exhibiting for that show. And if you're interested in, in seeing the preview of the show when it is available, if you're interested in the originals, for the show because I think there's it's gonna be like uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 pieces and they're of varying sizes so I have the larger ones are of the size of this piece and I have even some really small ones that are like three by three inches so they're little mini pieces and if you're interested in any of these originals then you can email info at havenartgallery.com and ask Erica to put you on the Stephanie Law preview list because she sends that out usually like two or three weeks before opening the seals up to public. So if you're interested, that's what you should do. But also I've been, I've been showing, if you're, if you're just interested in seeing the artwork, I've been showing a lot of little sneak peeks in the walkthroughs and um, little process posts that I have on my Patreon as well over the past few months and I will continue to do so sort of revealing little sneak peeks of the pieces as they're finished. Sam says, I read recently about these bright flowers that grow near rocks and the locals pick them and the flowers are now evolving to be less bright to camouflage into the rocks to survive. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's survival of the fittest there, right? <laughs> the plant assumes that the flowers are being eaten. <laughs> so make less colorful flowers. I have a bunch of nasturtiums in my backyard and at first I think I started off with I started off with like two varieties only and they were pretty plain in their coloring but then now six years later because they so they self sow so they just start they just start uh, dropping seeds everywhere and growing all over the yard which is awesome because I love I love them <laughs> but the neat, the really neat thing though, is that they've started to hybridize. And so over the years, I've gotten more and more interesting colors and variations on them. And I don't even have to do anything. I just, I just enjoy them, but they just start becoming more like some of them are look are kind of frilly looking. And then some of them are these really deep maroon red, which I love. I like those the best because most of the time you see them as yellow and orange colored. So I just did a little bit more buff titanium and, and a wash on that rose there just to get a little bit more of a base tone on it. Same with this one, I'm going to add some buff titanium. And then when I'm painting the shading in detail, I am leaving the highlight areas showing, you know, this buff titanium color and the, the Shading is what pushes those elements to recede into the piece. So they're like pushing them deeper into the shadowed and recesses and things. And that's, that's how you work with watercolor. So it's different from oils and acrylics where that's an additive medium where you are building up to your light colors. You know, the light colors are the areas of the painting if you're looking at a, if you're looking at an oil or acrylic painting, the white areas are usually the parts of the painting that have the most layers of paint. 
whereas in watercolor it's the reverse. So the white areas are the parts of the painting that have the least amount of pigment and color that have been that have been laid out there. And the you know if watercolor were thick, which it isn't because it's it's just this it's just a thin, you know, water soluble thing that soaks into your paper and all you have is just a little bit of pigment that sits on top. It if you were to have some sort of uh, density to the pigment, you would be able to see that the areas that are darkest are in fact the areas that have the most buildup of paint. So in particular, if you're looking at this piece here, these dark sections of vines and things in the in between the roses, those areas are where there is the most pigment and the most layers that I've slowly built up. Whereas the highlights on these roses and even like this edge of the wall here and the paler striations on the door, those are the parts that have the least amount of pigment and layering. Those are the areas that are closest to being just the initial washes that I laid in, as you see here with this rose right now, you know where I'm doing this, this wash. The, the highlights of this rose are the places where I basically just don't, I don't ever touch it again after laying down that initial wash. At least I don't touch it with pigment. I might, I might use a, a light layer of water just to help blend and smooth things, which I actually do quite frequently. I'll use these, these water glazes, I'll call them, um, where I, I use them to blend out the textures a little bit so and and to and to meld colors and things so that they are more continuous and you know water can be very useful for that you know watercolor painting to just help smooth things out Hello everyone that is joining later now. I'm just working on roses for the foreseeable future here. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to just throw those out into the chat. It can be about any subject. It doesn't have to be about what I'm painting here or, or specifically about the watercolor. If you have questions about artist life in general, I'm happy to answer any of that stuff as well. What species are the birds or are they imagined? These are, well, a lot of times I do just completely imagine the creatures and plants in my paintings, especially, well, no, only I guess in the, in the fantasy work. In the, in the botanical work, those are very specific species and, you know, based on a subject matter with reference and everything and very as, as true as possible to the reality of whatever it is I'm painting, whether that's creature or plant. And then in my fantasy work like this, I basically just let myself do whatever suits the composition or it, you know, if there is something that is necessary for a meaning of the piece, like in one I believe I used a, a Bodhi tree which is what Buddha sat underneath, um, and it's a, it's a type of ficus plant. But in, in, in that case, you know, I was very careful to render the Bodhi plant very specifically, but a lot of times I just use my imagination for the creatures and the plants, and I use a lot of artistic license to go with what suits my compositional and color needs of a piece rather than adhering strictly to reality. And that's part of the fun of doing fantasy art, right? <laughs> so to answer your question specifically though, so that's more of a general answer about, you know, when you see things in my, in my pictures, not, they're not always necessarily something that adheres to reality if it's one of my fantasy pieces. In this case, these are roughly based on ruby-throated hummingbirds, Anna's hummingbirds, 
uh, of which we have a lot of here in my local environs. So I see little hummingbirds that look just like this all the time. They've got a little red breast and iridescent, pale greenish gray coloration for the rest of their body. And they're really cool. They like to hang out by my succulent flowers when they are in bloom. <laughs> and some of the other plants that we've got in the yard. They're super noisy though. <laughs> you wouldn't think it of these little tiny guys because you know they're only they're, they're smaller than the size of my hand. They're like half the size of my hand. But in the springtime when they start mating, they get really territorial. And if you even come near a bush, and, and by near I mean within 10 feet of where they are, you might not even notice them there initially, they'll start doing this really angry, insistent chirping. <laughs> so I frequently see them not because I was looking for them or even spotted them on my own, but I'll, I'll hear them. I'll hear them in the bush being really angry at me. <laughs> and so they do this little chirp, 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 chirp thing. <laughs> but there was one time I wanted to get a really nice close-up photo of, of them and I have a telephoto lens and I sat down and I wasn't even that far. I sat down like 10 feet away from one of my succulent plants that was in flower. And I had seen in previous days, I was just kind of reading out, outdoors on previous days, just hanging out there on the patio. And I had seen little hummingbirds coming and visiting the flowers. And so I thought, well, maybe if I just hang out here and and just do my thing and read and don't move suddenly or make any jostling motions and things. If I just hang out here like this, then maybe I can spot one of the hummingbirds when they come by again. And so I did that. I didn't even have to pay attention to the flowers. All I did was I focused my camera ahead of time on the flower. And, and then I just read, I just like duck my head down and I was reading and sure enough, like within 20 minutes of me being there, because they just keep coming back to this plant, I heard that little chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> and so I was able to whip my camera up really quickly and, and get a shot. So that was, that was kind of neat. Actually, oh, here it is. I can show you the botanical painting also that I based on that. So there is... There's that little hummingbird. It's Anna's hummingbird. That's what they're called. The, the males are a little bit brighter in color, but the females basically have the same coloration, just a tiny bit more muted. And you can't see the chest of this one, but it is usually a little bit pinkish red. Sorry, I'm just scrolling back over the conversation in the chat to see about stuff I missed because I wasn't reading that while I was talking about hummingbirds just now. Cassie Ma says, I have your tarot cards, you're a beautiful artist. Thank you so much. Uh, Lyra Bjorn, Bjorn says, your colors aren't reactivating much. Is that because they are good quality or because you're not using much water? It's a combination of things. So they're not reactivating much because I'm doing dry brush here. So if I were to take a wet, a wet flat brush and just, you know, swipe across stuff, yes, it will reactivate and blend and blur. But my brush is, is fairly dry. I have just enough pigment and liquid on there to, to do this very light, sketchy sort of painting and this is, this is how I this is how I do all my botanical work as well and, and this is how I do the detailed rendery bits of my water of my fantasy watercolor paintings but it really doesn't lift or activate any of the previous layers by doing this by doing dry brush doing washes and glazes yes that is going to reactivate and and um, lift some of the previous layers, but also having nice paper will help with 
maintaining control over that. I, I don't know if it will lessen, but it really kind of depends on the paper that you use. So for me, uh, so I'm using Milan de Roy, which is, uh, and it's also 300 pounds, so it's fairly thick. Um, but some people complain that it actually lifts too easy for them. I've not had that problem with it. I find that it it behaves perfectly for my techniques and my method of working. And and I would, you know, not not everyone is going to work the same or with the same amount of liquid on their brush or with the same kind of brushwork and techniques and things and and so Paper preference is, is very personal for every artist. You know, I've recommended this paper to some artists who absolutely hate it, whereas the great majority of botanical artists seem to love Moulin de Roy. It was one of the favorites. I say was because it is no longer being made. You can find it occasionally in some online stores still that have some old stock left, but it is no longer being created anew. So I don't recommend trying it and getting attached to it <laughs> if you have not already used it. Find something else. Find something else that's already that that not is not already. Right. Find something else that's still being made. <laughs> Which seems to be a hard task because it feels like paper is constantly being discontinued. This is the third favorite paper that I've had over the years because each time they stopped being made <laughs> and I had to find something new and I feel like I, it wasn't even that long ago that I switched to switched to this so I have I have a good stockpile of it for myself so I'm good for the foreseeable future but eventually at some point I'm going to have to look around and find some others. Thanks. A uh, little pearl, little pear finer. It says, I missed it, but you mainly use Daniel Smith. Yes, right now I am mainly using Daniel Smith, although the blue that I have in this piece is Roman Sesmol. Um, and in particular, the two colors are ocean blue and cobalt teal that I am using for this really pretty electric blue. And Daniel Smith actually did come out with a new blue early last year that is of a similar sort. And I don't recall right now what it is called. I'll see if I can remember and put it into the links later when I archive this video. But most of my colors, yes, are Daniel Smith. And most of what I'm using for the rest of this is, is Daniel Smith. Noel Thoris is fascinated by the underdrawing. Is it done in pencil? Yes, it is. It is a pencil sketch directly onto my watercolor paper and I keep it fairly light so that really by the time I finish painting, you don't see any pencil left at all. It either gets rubbed away by the passage of my hand back and forth over things as I'm working, or else it just gets obscured by the layers of paint and color. So you can see I, I don't sketch very dark either in the first place, so that's that's my pencil lines, and you really don't see any of it left here on this rose that I've been working on just now. And pencil is no longer visible at all. It's just, yeah, it's funny because I get, 
I get asked about the pencil lines all the time and people say do you do you erase them or what do you do about pencil and stuff and I actually basically just don't pay attention to it <laughs> I just I just paint over it and by the time I finish it's just a non-issue it's just not there anymore and on the rare occasions if I do sketch too hard and I did press my pencil too much in the paper. Kneaded erasers are awesome for just lifting a little bit of the pencil. So what I do is I usually kind of shape it into a log and then you can kind of roll it across your pencil and it will just, you know, depending on how hard you press, it will pick up more or less of the graphite. And it's a good way of just lightly lessening the amount of graphite you have on a page without completely erasing your your sketch. And I use an HB.3 lead. Oh, actually, no, these days I use, I use 0.2. I, this is my favorite pencil for sketching. So I don't use this for thumbnailing and brainstorming and things. I like to use a thicker lead for that. I use like 0.5 or even a pencil or a lead holder, I mean, but when I'm sketching for my painting ready to go on my board, I use a 0.2 with HB and that keeps my lines very fine and precise and not too much graphite to worry about and to muddy the painting because that's, that's another thing. If you have too much graphite, loose graphite around, it's just going to give you a sort of dirty look to your colors and you lose that that purity of uh, of just this glowing tone that watercolor has which makes watercolor such an amazing medium and one of the reasons why I love watercolor so yeah you don't ever want to have too much graphite muddying things and dirtying it up and and so yeah that's that's the other reason why I use the the kneaded eraser if I ever feel that that might be a potential hazard <laughs> with a specific piece. Am I working in my home studio? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, Precipita says, beautiful, your books helped me as a teenager to become the artist I am today and the knowledge I have today. You inspired me so much. Thank you so much. That is really wonderful and amazing to hear and it's it's one of the reasons I'm really glad to have made those watercolor tutorial books. I love hearing about how they have inspired people to create and to paint. So thank you. <laughs> have I ever stretched watercolor people over stretcher bars like canvas? No, I have not. I don't, I don't really, well, I mostly use 300 pound paper, first of all. So that's pretty heavy on its own already. And as long as I tape it down, there really is no warping at the end of the process. And I get really heavy with my layers and washes sometimes, especially when I'm using my gold leaf and gold foil techniques and things. So I, I don't feel that stretching is a necessary thing to do, <laughs> especially with 300 pound paper. But even when I'm not using 300 pounds, so I do use occasionally a 140 pound, and sometimes that gets, it looks like it's a little bit buckled, but what you can do with that is when you're done, you can take a, a spray bottle and spray the back of it with water. And then I put it um, between some other, you know, I have some blotter sheets, which is basically some large sheets of watercolor paper that I didn't like actually painting with. <laughs> I didn't like the, the quality of it, so I use them for pressing flat these paintings if I need to. So you just spray the back of it very, very, very lightly with water, not too much, because you don't want to have it soaking the paper and reactivating your paint on the front side. And then you just put it between some sheets and flatten it between some heavy stuff, and it gets all nice and flat again real easily. But I've, I've not even had to do that very often. That's That's been pretty rare. Um, so, yeah. 
I don't, I don't feel like stretching is a necessary thing. Just make sure you tape down the piece before you start. Um, and don't untape it until you are completely done and everything is completely dry. <laughs> you can also buy watercolor uh, blocks, is what they're called, where they're pre-stretched papers, right? They are, but you have to get them then in standard sizes. And because I like to do things a difficult way and I never paint on a standard size or even a standard shape these days. <laughs> I don't really use blocks that often, but they can be very handy if you are someone that is going to paint in a standard size, which by the way also makes for easier framing experience. <laughs> um, and watercolor blocks are great because you don't have to worry about any buckling at all. They are, they are actually stretched and they are kind of glued on the edges, on all four edges. Don't get the ones that are only glued on two edges. I like the four edge ones. And, you know, so <laughs> I talked with an art supply company once and and I was like, why do you do only the two edge ones? Cause that's, it's not as good. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do the job as well. And their answer was that art stores didn't want to carry the four edge uh, art blocks because too many people were returning the blocks as so-called defective because they couldn't figure out what they were supposed to do with the watercolor block. Uh, so what you do do is, is if it's sealed on all four sides, there's usually a tiny little opening that's maybe two or three inches on one side of the block where it's not glued. And you just take a butter knife or a spatula, or not a spatula, <laughs> a um, palette knife, and you just kind of stick it underneath the top sheet of paper and then you just kind of run it around the whole edge of the block and it frees the page when you are done painting and it'll be all nice and flat and stuff but yeah I thought that was that was uh I don't know what to say about that that the stores just didn't want to carry the four the four-sided ones because people didn't know what to do with it um but yeah, you should be able to find four-sided ones as well. I just recommend the four-sided ones if you are going to go for a block. Illuminated Rose says, if you ever went over a highlight, would you go back over in white paint? You can. I do have white gouache in my palette as an option. It's always best to use the white of the page. It's always going to give you the most luminous watercolor quality if you can maintain the highlights as unpainted or lightly painted areas. So I, I suggest, like what I always suggest is, is try to work towards being able to do that because it will make for better paintings in the end. Like even if you decide that you want to be using white and to 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 create your your lights like master being able to use the white of your paper first so that you can judiciously use that or the opaque white at your own discretion rather than having to use white because oops i didn't leave that area white and, and you know it is fine like i say it's fine <laughs> but traditional watercolors will be very, very upset at anyone who uses opaque white, but I'm not very traditional in my approach to my paintings and my techniques. I use all kinds of mixed mediums and I do all kinds of things that are frowned on by traditionalist watercolors, watercolorists. And so, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. Um, and for most people, it won't matter as well. But I do think that there's value in being able to master that ability and to be able to paint in that way even if you decide not to and if you decide to sometimes use white because i i do sometimes use white i do sometimes use opaque colors in mine and i have a white um, watercolor ground which is sort of like this just so thing that sometimes i will paint over whole sections of my painting in order to do a sort of negative space white pale look um, and if you're interested in, in hearing more about that specifically, you can check out my Patreon because I actually have a lot of the 
walkthroughs or the and the videos and things where I've done techniques like that. But I, I always do like to underscore like learn learn how to use watercolors the with the transparency because that is one of the most gorgeous elements and the reason for using watercolor because it, it really conveys this beautiful quality that you can't achieve with other mediums and it's it's why I love watercolors. So missing out on that is is just is just really missing out. <laughs> Sorry, I'm catching up again on the chat. I think I missed a lot of things now. I don't know how far back I am. <laughs> Rainforest L says, can you tell us about your brushes? Currently what I've been using for the majority of this right now is a size zero Rosemary and Company sable brush. I actually want to try their Rosemary and Company synthetics. I have not yet had a chance to do that because I've been happily using the sables that I have from there. And I've heard good things though about the synthetics also from Rosemary and Company. But yeah, because I'm doing mostly dry brush, little tiny detail things here, I'm pretty much exclusively just using this one brush right now. At least for this phase of the painting. What do I think about Arches Hot Pressed? I have not used Arches Hot Press actually. Although I do know a lot of artists who favor that. So I've heard I've heard good things about it, but I've also heard it's like like I said, paper is just such a personal preference thing for so many artists and, and it really, really depends on how each person paints because I've I know many professional artists who love arches and I also know some who absolutely hate it so <laughs> and like I said I know people who hate Roman uh, who hate uh, Mulan Roy because they think it it lifts too easy or it, it doesn't take their washes very well but for me it performs heavenly so I know some of the art supply uh, companies online they they sell sampler packs of paper where you can try a whole lot of different high quality papers and you can test your own techniques on them and and see what actually works the best for you. I think that once my Moulin de Roy stash is used up I'll probably do that and try to see what is going to be my next go-to. <laughs> Let's see, 300 GSM Mulan de Roy, okay to use, Stalking Artist asks. Yeah, so 300 GSM would be the equivalent of the 140 pound. And yeah, like I said, I, I use I use 140 pound um, for one of the other papers I use. Fluid is the, the brand that I have. They don't have an, an actual 300 pound hot press. So they were the ones that I was using before I found Mulan de Roy, and I still have some of them. So I try to use that up trying to use that up slowly <laughs> and so I still have a lot of it but yeah like I said that is I, I use 140 pound for that and it's just fine just tape your work down before you start and it's all good I'm zooming in over here a little bit more scooching over as I am rotating onto the next rose. Are you tired of watching me paint roses? <laughs> so this is what I'm this is where I was talking about earlier where I use water sometimes to just lightly run over areas and blend. So yes, there's the there's some lifting happening here and reactivating as I do this. Uh, 
how do I stop my neck from aching? I see your palette is fat, flat. I get so sore. Um, no, it doesn't bother me. I've always painted flat. I actually don't like easel setups. <laughs> and I've not ever had any neck or back problem issues from painting like this. So, you know, like paper, I think it's personal with each artist and just how your own posture is and how you sit and, and work. And for me, this, this has always worked. And it's been, what, 20, 22 years of doing this full time. Well, full time, let's see, 20 years of doing this full time, but 22 or 23 years of really pretty intensively painting every day. What are my opinions on Opera Pink? Stalking Artists is asking. I do not own Opera Pink. I have been tempted by it, but because I do most of my work for sale as originals, I have to be careful about fugitive pigments and things. And so given Opera Pink's reputation and, and its actual fugitiveness, <laughs> I have avoided it. But for, for people who are not focusing on selling originals or who are using some combination of digital uh, end result for their pieces, I think Opera Pink is great because it's such a vibrant color. It's a very pretty pink. I stick to mainly Quinnipred drones then for my rose pink toned things and by rose i'm not talking about roses but rosy color <laughs> oh what does fugitive mean illuminated rose says fugitive is is when colors are not permanent when exposed to light, they will fade. And in some cases fade very quickly. And um, there, there are a lot of, if you do a search on Google, there are many artists who do tests on the archival, archivalness and fugitive qualities of various pigments and paints and will will post the results because you know, what you do is you, you make test little swatches that you then expose to sunlight, sometimes really harsh sunlight, sometimes just regular room, uh, room sunlight, you know, the normal kind of exposure a painting would get. And then you wait six months or a year or longer and see what the results are. And if the, so you cover up half of it and you'll, you'll see if one half of it gets really faded or light or changes because some pigments will change tone and color even just from exposure to air. But opera pink is just one of those that is a known pigment to really fade drastically within six months of painting. So it's, it's not a good one to use if one is a, an artist that is primarily selling their work in original format because it means that when the buyer buys a piece, it's going to change <laughs> in the time of their ownership. And that's usually not a pleasant surprise for people. It's... But most, well, any, any professional uh, quality watercolor pigment will list how light fast it is. So light fastness is how uh, resistant it is to changing color when, it, when exposed to light, UV light specifically. And they'll, they'll usually have a light fastness rating. So most professional quality pigments are going to be pretty light fast overall. There's a few colors that are just really special. <laughs> 
and that they will be included just because people really want those colors and there's just no other alternative to getting that kind of vibrant tone or quality to the pigment other than with that specific thing. In as an example, you know, we're talking about opera pink because it's such a really electric, vibrant pink tone and there isn't really anything else that matches it. It's kind of neon even in, in, in how it looks. And there's nothing that is uh, that is light fast that can compete with that. And so that's, that's why a lot of these high quality watercolor companies will still include that. But even, you know, colors like alizarin crimson, which, so this one over here is actually permanent alizarin crimson. Uh, can you see it on the screen? Yeah, there it is. Permanent alizarin crimson. And maybe, I don't even know when permanent alizarin crimson came into being, um, but before this, the old versions of alizarin crimson were not light fast. And then once this version was created, most of the companies have switched to this now because it is much more reliable in the long term. On the back of Winston Newton Cadmium Red, I got, it says it is known to cause cancer. Well, that's because it's got heavy metals in it, but you don't really need to worry about it unless you're going to be, you know, taking the tube and, and just <laughs> squeezing it into your mouth. Uh, the amount of exposure you're going to get to any of these from painting with them in a responsible way is negligible. So that is not something I'd worry about. Some of the oil painting uh, mediums that they use to hasten the drying time, those though can be extremely deadly and those are things you got to watch out for. But the amount of cadmium that is in cadmium colors and that you're going to use in a painting, generally wouldn't worry about it. Um, on the other hand, though, I actually don't like using the cadmium colors because cadmium is a, it's a much more opaque tone to it. They're not transparent, so they don't, they don't take advantage of, as I was talking about earlier, the beautiful transparent qualities of watercolor. And the quinacridrone colors are my preference to replace cadmiums. I used to use cadmiums in my in my palette set and I had you know cadmiums for all the red, orange, yellow tones but these days it's pretty much all replaced by quinacridrones because they are vibrant, they're, they're translucent, and they're light fast. So let's see that's a quin, that's a quin, that's a quin, that's a quin, this one, this one, yeah, so I've got like six or seven quinacridrones within my red, orange, yellow range here. And if you if you go to a watercolor um, company's website, you can you can see there's there's like twenty different quinacridrone shades, and they are all really, really bright. Oh, even they even go into the purples, I believe. Yeah, this quin pur this is quinacridrone purple over here so they they are they are great and it's it's like a good quarter of my set here is quinacrid drones <laughs> because they as i said they are light fast they are vibrant and they are not and they're transparent and they are not toxic heavy metals <laughs> so you know that's four points in their favor <laughs> go for quinacrid drones Replace all those cadmiums, then you don't even have to worry about that. <laughs> anyway, I think we gotta call this to a close now. It's been over an hour. Thank you for hanging out with me and joining me today. You're gonna zoom out and I can show you the result of what's been happening during this past hour. There we go. So it was all those roses down there that I've been working on today. And let's see, that's that was the 
one, two, three and a half roses that I was able to complete in the one hour of hanging out and talking with you all. So <laughs> you can see that there's going to be quite a bit more to do in this piece and a lot of time still to spend on it. No more roses up above, but I still have many more along the side here and alongside here and this stuff. Anyway, thanks again for joining me. I hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble on about various things and seeing lots of roses happen in here. And I will see you next time. Bye.